hope of reconciliation. And as part of the work we do to live in right, right relations, we acknowledge this land upon which we worship and work is part of Treaty 18 of 1818 and is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg, Haudenosaunee, Tiamatate, and Wendat peoples who have cared for this land for generations and whose relationship with this land has been at the center of their lives and spirituality. We seek to continue to honor that in our work and witness on this land. We have leftovers from the big table yesterday, just a few, in the back room. So when you're done worship here, uh, Neil is going to run out there with Skylar and Harper and Blythe. They're going to come down from upstairs with Alindra from Sunday school and see if they can interest you in any of the wares on our bake table. We have baked goods for the for, and a flash table with a few other little items, and then we've got some knitted items. And the knitted items proceeds are going to out of the cold. It's by donation only. Whatever doesn't go off our knitted table will be donated to Out of the Cold. And we thank all those wonderful knitters in our congregation who contributed to that. We've already raised over $250 for Out of the Cold from the, yesterday's sale. And over $700 for the children and youth in the congregation and their outreach work uh, through our bake sale yesterday. So. <laughs> Supper, as you know, last Sunday, and we raised over $2,000 there for our mission and ministry here at Centennial, and so we're thankful for that. Uh, at the back of the church, you'll see there's a newsletter that we've put out so you can find out everything that's happening throughout December here at the church. Uh, just a reminder for everybody that on Christmas Eve, in lieu of the morning service, we're going to have our Christmas Eve service at 2 p.m. So there won't be a morning service that day. It is a Sunday that Christmas Eve falls on this year. So we thought we'd do something a little bit different. We'd have our Christmas Eve service at 2 p.m. and we have Christmas pudding after. So we hope that you can all join us for that <laughs> wonderful service. And just, uh, it's, it's been fixed in your bulletins and on the PowerPoint and in the newsletter, but the women's meeting is going to be on December 5th. So we're going to have special Christmas lunch. You're invited to bring socks or toques, mitts, items the, for out of the cold um, to that meeting. And, right? Yes. Yes. Um, so those are just some of the things that are, are going on um, in the congregation. And other things, I'm sure, will be brought to your attention throughout the worship service in different places. But are there other things that I should announce? Yes. Well, I wouldn't say an announcement, but I uh, the, uh, wanted to thank our we processed cattle yesterday. No humans or animals were hurt. And your Neil and Neela were very helpful in uh, getting that done. So I wanted to mention that today. Oh, thank you. Oh, that's so cool. Thank you very much. Yeah, Neil and Neela had a fun day yesterday uh, at uh, Jim and Myrna Whitley, Whitley's where they were processing cattle, and no one was hurt and no animals were hurt either. So, <laughs> although I did hear there was a fun story about a gate and then a calf and. <laughs> yes, yeah, it was really great, and they've they've done it once before at a farm in Saskatchewan. And Neil mentioned that there was a lot less yelling at Whitley's. In fact, <laughs> in fact none. <laughs> and he was quite surprised because the last time they had done it, no names mentioned, but if anyone's watching from Gilmington, they'll know who they did it with. There was quite a bit of yelling. <laughs> Different styles, and they really appreciated yours, Jim. Uh, in our other joys, other concerns as we come to worship this morning, I want to mention uh, Doug Robinson and invite your continued prayers for him. He had heart surgery on Tuesday and then he had to go in for a second surgery yesterday after suffering a heart attack in between. So uh, we keep his family and Doug in our prayers. Uh, just to add insult to injury, when his family went to visit yesterday following Doug's surgery, they got a call that the hospital was in lockdown, or at least where they wanted to visit because of COVID. 
so they couldn't go and see Doug. So um, they especially need our prayers today as we gather. And another um, need for, for our prayers is Wendy Whalen, who joined our church last Sunday. Um, she suffered a stroke on Thursday, and she's in the hospital in Barrie and facing uh, long rehabilitation. And so we pray that she won't have any setbacks and that her recovery will be complete. So that was very shocking to receive that news. <clears throat> and we keep them in our prayers. Uh, we know that Wendy Dunlop is going for surgery this week on the 29th for her heart as well. And that this has been a stressful time of waiting and worrying. And so we keep you in our prayers and we'll be praying for you on the 29th, Wendy, as you are facing that surgery. Um, we continue to pray for Valerie, who's still recovering from her heart surgery. And she has a little bit of, I, I always love it, my sister says this too sometimes, I've just got a little a touch of pneumonia. <laughs> There's a little bit of fluid on one of Valerie's lungs that she had to have drained. And so um, we keep her in our prayers. Uh, Marge Ridley, who you haven't seen in church for a couple weeks, has been struggling with a very bad back and is in a lot of pain. And she's asked for us to pray for her at this time. She thought, oh, I've waited long enough. It's time to add, add us to your prayers. So we pray for Marge and Wayne. And I invite your continued prayers for my sister, who is in kidney failure at St. John Hospital in New Brunswick. Uh, it's the beginning stages. They're hoping they can control it with medication. Uh, as some of you know, my sister had a kidney transplant with her pancreas transplant um, 10 years ago. And that's sometimes about how long you get when you have a kidney transplant out of the kidney. So we continue to pray for her. Uh, we continue to play, pray for Greta's cousin, Glenda, who's recovering from heart surgery in Australia. And I wanted to mention a family in our congregation, uh, Rodney Lake and his partner, Kayla, and their son, Raiden, have had to relocate. And they're in a living, uh, they found an apartment to rent, but they have very little furniture. And so if you have any furniture, uh, that you think you could spare, or especially like a kitchen cabinet or an island for a kitchen. Um, if you could talk to me after church, we're just trying to get them set up so they have a little more to sit on right now. They're, they're watching TV. They've got a TV, but they're watching it on lawn chairs, you know, the foldable kind. <laughs> so uh, we keep them in our prayers as they struggle um, with housing insecurity. So that was a lot, but there may be more, and there are more on our hearts we know, not just in our own family, but around the world that we pray for today. Are there others that we would like to name out loud? We pray for Ukraine, for those in Israel and Palestine, the Gaza Strip. We know there is much to be prayed for in this world as we gather for worship. But I also want to um, welcome back Joan and Ron from their trip. They've come back from a trip out east, and so we're glad to see you today at church. And John and Sandra, you just had a trip too. We've been tripping all year. I know. <laughs>
we were just taking slide baskets because I forgot our hymn. I thought, oh, we'll start with a hymn today. And then I forgot, because normally we don't start with a hymn. Uh, well, this is United Number Two, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Thank you, Mila. Verse 
one of a candle is burning to complete our Advent candle red lighting. <laughs>
Ready for this? We just did it at, at uh, oh. dinner, so we just... Oh. <laughs> 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 oh, sorry. Did I fall asleep again?
sleep, and now you've got a shawl. It's perfect. Fashion. Okay, we're going to sing about angels. Alinda's going to come, and you're going to talk some more about hope, I think, at, at Sunday school today. And you have an Advent candle wreath up in your Sunday school room, just like we have down here. And so you can look around the church from some different ways that we're getting ready. You got it. All right, angels we have heard on high, number 38. No one goes to you for help. 
you have hidden yourself from us and ab abandoned us because of our sins. But you are our Father, Lord. We are like clay, and you are like the potter. You created us. So do not be too angry with us or hold our sins against us forever. We are your people. Be merciful to us. And our second reading is from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 13, verses 24 to 37. In the days after that time of trouble, the sun will grow dark, the moon will no longer shine, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers in space will be driven from their courses. Then the Son of Man will appear, coming in the clouds with great power and glory. He will send the angels out to the four corners of the earth to gather God's chosen people from one end of the world to the other. Let the fig tree teach you a lesson. When its branches become green and tender and it starts putting out leaves, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see these things happening, you will know that the time is near, ready to begin. Remember that all these things will happen before the people now living have all died. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. No one knows, however, when that day or hour will come. Neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, only the Father knows. Be on watch, be alert, for you do not know when that time will come. It will be like a man who goes away from home on a journey and leaves his servants in charge after giving to each one his own work to do and after telling the doorkeeper to keep watch. Be on guard then, because you do not know when the master of the house is coming. It might be in the evening or at midnight or before dawn, or at sunrise. If he comes suddenly, he must not find you asleep. What I say to you then, I say to all, watch. Let us pray. Loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. At the end of October, I was able to attend the Lester Randall Preaching <coughs> Fellowship held at Yorkminster Park Baptist Church in Toronto. It was part of my continuing education. The theme of the conference was Amazing Grace. And there were several quite famous preachers in attendance, including my former preaching professor at Emmanuel College, Paul Scott Wilson. I'm never sure how many like people in the pews have even heard of the, the preachers that I consider famous. But just in case I'm not the only one who was impressed by the lineup, Caroline Lewis, Chair of Biblical Preaching at Luther Seminary in Minnesota was there, along with Will Willimon, Professor at Duke Divinity School in North Carolina, were among the keynote speakers. <coughs> but perhaps more of you will have heard of a couple of the other famous people there leading workshops that I attended. Terry Fabulous. Canadian author of humorous novels. Maybe some of you have read Terry. And R.H. Thompson, the Canadian actor best known, by me anyway, for his role playing Jasper Dale on Road to Avonlea, and then the character of Matthew in Anne with an E. I can't help it, I love with Lucy Maud Montgomery. In fact, another piece of continuing education I did a couple of years ago was all about the theology and the work of Lucy Maud Montgomery. I can't tell you how starstruck I was sitting in the little library at Yorkminster Park Baptist Church with about 12 other people listening to R.H. Thompson recite poetry and help us find our authentic voice. It was very cool. <coughs> The thing that helped me most out of the conference was 
some of the preaching that Will Willimon did and how he reminded us that the amazing grace of God is that God can work through us even when we make mistakes and that it isn't dependent on us to be perfect and order for grace to get through and make changes in the world. And so as I stand before you today, having made my mistakes of my own this morning, I am comforted by that. But one of the most moving parts of the Lester Randall Preaching Fellowship for me, that's why I'm telling you all about my Con Ed experience, happened on the Monday afternoon when a panel of speakers took turns at the front of the impressive sanctuary and each shared stories from their lives in which they had seen God's amazing grace revealed. The panel discussion was entitled Testimonies of Grace. Before the panel began to share, my former preaching professor, the aforementioned Paul Scott Wilson, introduced the time of sharing and spoke of how experiencing grace in your everyday life was something you could either notice or not. It was all a matter of perspective. That's what's kind of tricky about grace. You have to have your eyes open to see it. You have to be awake to it. The first panelist, one of the other keynote speakers at the conference, Sarah Hahn, who's an assistant professor and director of Tyndale University in Toronto, shared a story. I don't remember it word for word, but I hope you can, I can give you the gist of it. She spoke of a young boy growing up in Korea with his mom and dad. It wasn't a great marriage, but they were together. Uh, and one day, his mom attended some kind of revivalist preaching event, and she experienced God there. And in that moment, she decided to become a Christian and be born again. And she threw herself into the church after that day. She gave everything to the church, from time to money. She was always at the church. She gave everything. And the boy's father was not okay with this change in his wife. And things went from not okay to bad. The boy's father's abuse increased and his mother felt like she had no other choice but to leave him and when she did, the church that she had given everything to her entire life kicked her out for getting divorced. Disillusioned and destitute with no support system, the boy's mother had to struggle for everything to raise her son. She worked hard to make sure he never suffered, but that meant she was always at work. And he saw her suffering and hurt. Needless to say, after that, he hated religion, blamed God for everything his mom had gone through. Just was never going to set foot in a church. So years later, that same boy had an opportunity to go to university in Canada as an international student, and he had a roommate who went to a Korean church nearby. He made it very clear on numerous occasions, every time he was invited, that he would never be going to church, ever. Not in a million years. Well, a few men, months went by, the boy was homesick and craving just like a taste of Korean food so badly that his roommate managed to convince him to come to the lunch that the church was holding. You don't have to come to church, but like the, the kimchi there is awesome. You have to come. He was promised all of the best traditional Korean foods his heart could desire and his stomach could hold. So out of complete desperation and homesickness, he went with his roommate to this lunch. And his roommate hadn't lied. The kimchi was amazing. Sitting beside him at the lunch was an older Korean man who asked him if he would like to come to church the following Sunday or something like that. Well, the boy, now a university student, just 
lost it. Like, he laid into this man about how he felt about God and everything that had happened to this, his family because of this so-called loving God. And he's yelling and even swearing at him for like 10 minutes. I mean, he just went on. Ending with how he had just come for the kimchi and there was nothing else they could offer him that he would ever, ever want. He was pretty sure that when it fell silent, someone would get up and escort him out. Or maybe yell at him. Instead, the older man just reached over and got another bowl of kimchi and settled in front of him and said, Eat as much kimchi as you like. Uh, come back next week. We have a lunch after church every week. You'll always be welcome. Sarah ended her story by revealing how that boy did decide to come back for more kimchi. It turned out the old man who had been sitting beside him was the minister of the church. And that experience around that table would eventually lead him to go into a church service and then to help the youth group and later become a minister. That was the story of his call. And she knew all this and had permission to share his story because he ended up becoming her husband. <laughs> they worked in ministry together and they were planting a church as we met at the con conference. It was more than kimchi, it was grace. This week, I shared with the Advent study group how on Monday, I had convinced my mom to meet me for a few hours while Colin was playing piano for the Primrose Elementary School Choir with my sister while they recorded for the CBC Music Challenge. Neither of us felt like doing anything given how sick my sister Carolyn has been, how hard it is to be here and not there while she is in the hospital and just really struggling. But we met at Superburger which is one of my favorite places to get fries. Ever since it opened, this is just an aside. Naturally, I ordered some while I was waiting for my mom to arrive. Maybe that's where the grace is. It's for you to decide. Mom, uh, when mom arrived, we shared a few tears over the fries. And then we thought, oh, maybe we could go to Giant Tiger. But there was a water main break in Shelburne, and the Giant Tiger had been flooded. <laughs> Alice didn't just seem too far, and it suddenly dawned on me that Orangeville had always been the place where we went shopping when I was growing up in Honeywood. Anybody remember Zellers in the Mall or the Pickle Barrel Restaurant? Is that what it was called? How about going to Orangeville? I suggested to Mom. It's even closer than Alice did, and they have a Marshalls in the Mall now, don't they? So off we went. But as we were driving there, I remembered Belinda said she needed a new pair of leggings, and the ones she likes are at Winners, so that's where we headed instead of the mall. And after finding leggings and a pair of jeans for my mom, I remembered that Neil had said she needed a winter coat. We looked at the women's section, but had no luck, so I thought, we'll go over it, we'll take a look in the men's section, see what coats are there, maybe there'd be something Neil would like better. Well, in the men's section of Winners in Orangeville, we ran into a neighbor of ours from our farm in Honeywood, who I haven't seen in years. When I was a teenager, I babysat his children, and his wife had been a really important person in my life. The last time I'd run into her had been at a Walmart in Barrie on New Year's Eve with my sister Carolyn, who was just out of the hospital and trying to recover from nearly dying from CMV, a vicious virus that infects transplant patients. And uh, his wife had just been so uplifting and understanding and just thrilled to see us. We left there feeling loved and cared for and thankful for the little community that we've grown up in. There, in that winter's on Monday, he told us that it had been exactly four years since his wife's death. And he was having a pretty hard day. I shared that memory of the last time I had seen her and what that had meant to me. I can only hope that it lifted his spirit.
spirits and made that day a little, just a little easier. And he felt grace in that moment like I did. That he knew the love and support found in community that could carry you through the hard times and give you strength to face the future. What's your testimony of grace? Where have you been awakened to memories of God's goodness? Where have you been alerted to the presence of God breaking into your life and opening doors of hope? This Advent, let us look for these signs of hope and grace that are all around us as we await the coming one restores us and makes us whole. Amen. So will you join with me in singing new words to a familiar hymn? It's to God rest ye merry gentlemen and you'll find the words in the bulletin or on the screen. <laughs> This adaptation is based on the uh, psalm for today. Until we give 
and in giving our hearts are filled. O oh God, may we be able to joyfully share our gifts with many with the vision of a better tomorrow, knowing that when we do so, we become like the Magi of old, offering our gifts to the refugee child, the child living on the margins, a child born in a stable in Bethlehem. Amen. We have so many ways that we give, that we can give this year. At the back, there's a list of items that our Christmas family uh, from Ontario Works um, is, it loves and would love to get for Christmas, but they can't afford to get it without our help. And so if you want to take a look at that and cross off something that you want to get from that list and bring to our white gift service, at our white gift service, there's an opportunity to make gifts with vision, give through mission and service. You can make an emergency support gift for what's happening right now in Israel and Palestine. The list goes on, the ways we can help. There's a food cupboard outside our doors that we can keep full and so that we can feed those in town right now immediately. There's a food bank that we can give to as we celebrate on White Gift if people bring donations for the food bank and the food cupboard and our Christmas families, we will be collecting it all. This is such a giving congregation and in all of our giving, we know the grace of God is felt. We express our love and praise in our offering of our goods and of ourselves. May we give with a hope that lightens the world. So, as our offering is brought forward, we'll sing together the fourth verse of In the Bleak Midwinter. And if you didn't get a chance to get your offering on the plate, just raise your hand and Doug will stop and make sure that it gets where it wants to go today.
in long-term nursing facilities, in seniors' residences, in supportive housing, in funeral homes where friends gather around the bereaved, and in all the private places where people take their grief. May we feel you in these places. May we feel you in this place and in every locale where people remember peace, where young people remember finding a place for themselves, where old people remember the earth healed, where children remember the dance of dolphins and surprise birthday parties. May we feel you these places. And in all the places we name aloud or in our hearts, where we know your grace desperately needs to be felt today. The hospital rooms in St. John, Newmarket and Barrie, where Carolyn, Doug, and Wendy are this morning. The homes of Marge, Rodney, Valerie, and Wendy. In Ukraine, Israel, Palestine, the Gaza Strip. Let your spirit mold and transform us, refreshing us if we are weary, quickening us when we are feeling old, reminding us of the future you have in store for us, despite all that we may do wrong. Restore us, O oh God. Let your face shine, that our hope might be awakened by your grace. Amen. And let us join in the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And so as we close our worship today, let us sing verses 1 and 4 of People Look East.
Let us do the good that is ours to do. Let us choose connection and hold on to hope that God's grace may be known. And let us be awake to the love of God, the grace of Christ, and the inbreaking of the Holy Spirit all around us, that with everlasting hope we might mirror the light of lights this day and forevermore. Amen. And so we sing. <laughs>